Uh, this morning was really, really good. I, I hope everybody found it valuable, got a lot of, of, of good information out of it, and I really do appreciate everyone um, who came to do um, their presentations, to take the time out of their busy days to do that, and we really were sorry that some of them weren't, but you know what I mean? Uh, they tried their best, and uh, unfortunately, things come up at the last minute, because I do know and believe that, you know, fluidity is really the name of the game, you know? We don't make hard, fast plans anymore. We say, I think we're going to do this today, but we'll wait and see, because we're not quite sure. So, uh, I really do um, appreciate that. So, this afternoon is really around, the first part is around healing of the heart, and and uh, to start with the seeds of hope. So, um, I will let Lynn speak to that, but uh, I just wanted to say that it's been so nice just to hug everybody, to have a chance to hear your stories, and I hope you all have had a chance to do that with each other as well. So, um, thank you for coming, and I'm going to pass it over to Lynn. So we got our technology back and we're ready to rock and roll here. The first, uh, well, our speaker uh, this afternoon is uh, Charmaine Hammond, which uh, you probably already know Charmaine, I'm not sure. But she's a professional speaker and author and expert in leadership, resilience and conflict management. She was actually a resident of Fort Mac for 16 years and left there in 2003, but her heart is still there and she continues to work with a number of agencies there and in fact working with Pew Social on a number of projects right now. Um, she's in, been involved in a number of community resilience projects, including one with EDA following the Calgary floods. And so, to Charmaine, Fort McMurray still feels like home, and it has a special place in her heart. So, here's Charmaine. Thank you. Oh, Jesus. When I stand behind this thing, I feel like that little dog in the back of a car. Like, the, do I look like that? Like that? I, I really, I think I'm going to go without the podium, and then, yes, that feels a little better. So thank you so much for having me here today and it's so lovely to see so many familiar faces and Lynn was right when I when I go to Fort McMurray which is a lot I've been gone since 2003 I think it was 2003 oh thank you I'll use that one 2003 I'm up there all the time in Fort McMurray and it really does still feel like home um, we're going to talk a little bit around building a resilient workplace and community and the presentations this morning weren't they powerful and just content rich how many of you would agree with me on that that just really helpful information I, I really appreciate all the presentations and you know one of the things that kept coming out for me is I think some of those messages we're going to have to hear again is that a fair statement I think for a lot of you right now, uh, there's so much information that you're being bombarded with and it's sort of like taking little baby steps, you know, getting through each day, which is different than what work and life would have looked like um, in Fort McMurray before the fire. How many saw that? How many of you saw that beautiful picture on Facebook? And I know, Brenda, when you were talking about the trees <laughs> for children, um, there's, there's kids all over Alberta right now that are taking their trees and saving them to go up to Fort McMurray. So I'm working with one of my partners, one of my sponsors, actually, to see if they'll provide the means to get all those trees to Fort McMurray when Fort McMurray is um, ready. But when I look at that picture, what, what do you see when you look at that picture? Let's just hear from a few of you. What do you see? What pops out? And speak really loud so we can hear you. What pops up for you? New life. New life. Thank you. Rich loan. Say again. Rich loan. Rich loan. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. What else? Green energy. Green energy. So when we're talking about compassion fatigue and resilience, it's really important for us to have this conversation now before you all start heading towards Fort McMurray, whenever that is going to be for each of you. And you heard all the speakers today say in their own unique way that things are going to be different. The way that we operate in our organizations and the way that business is operated is going to be different. There's going to be a lot of change, and change is messy at the best of times. How many of you would agree with me on that? The change is messy at the best of times. You've all been through change in your organizations prior to the fire. So change is messy, change is, is clunky, and it takes people to a high state of vulnerability 
which is not comfortable for many people. So when we think about compassion fatigue, you can see the, de the definition here. This is one definition that I love, but it's that state that's experienced by the people uh, that are helping other people or animals um, in distress. And it's an extreme state of tension and preoccupation with the suffering of those that are actually being helped to the degree that it can cause secondary traumatic stress on the people that are helping. And so all of you, uh, for all of you, this is important information. So some of the things that we might see in the workplace, I'm going to talk about resilience and compassion fatigue as it relates to the workplace. Not so much as it relates to us with the clients that you're going to be serving, but please know that everything we talk about here is completely relatable to the individuals that you serve. So when we think about compassion fatigue, one of the things that happens after a crisis, a disaster, or a trauma, and I heard this firsthand, I did a lot of work up in Slave Lake and Calgary on different resilience projects, and the one thing that stood out for me from both communities was how important it was for people to learn about compassion fatigue and resilience. It's different than stress management. Many of you have taken stress management courses before. What we're talking about is actually a culture change that needs to happen to create a healthy, resilient workplace. And it's so important to know that each one of you is going to deal with change differently. Is that a fair statement? Each of you is. And, and how you cope with change may be changing on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm hearing that from my friends, that how they coped yesterday is different than how they're coping the next day. So there's a lot of change involved. One of the things that we hear, and I heard it from Slave Lake in Calgary, was that from a workplace perspective, so for boards and, and executive directors, this is really important to know, that as you go back, and even in the preparation to go back, you're probably going to hear more complaints about things than you've ever heard complaints about before. And as a director or a board, some of them might seem really minor to you. So in our head, you know, we all talk to ourselves, right? <laughs> we all talk to ourselves, we've got that subconscious chatter that's always happening. So one of the things that happens for leadership is that as we hear complaints that seem minor from our perspective, um, we, we might dismiss it. Or we might kind of poo-poo it, that it's, you know, that's, that's minor, look at the big scope of what we're dealing with. But it's really important to know that often, our frustration with a big situation is expressed by a series of small complaints. Does that make sense? Because sometimes it's just too hard for people to get their head around a big situation. So be prepared that there may be a lot of complaints, there may be a lot of blaming and finger pointing. And so part of what we do as leadership is, is listening and hearing the story and being able to support people, but also to help them find solutions. There's two things that I really want you to take away from this presentation. And one is that in the absence of a plan comes chaos. So even though your plan may change day to day or hour to hour, it's been doing that since you left Fort McMurray, what's really important to know is that in the absence of a plan comes chaos. So the more you can do at a board level and at a leadership level is create plans, even if they're mini plans, how we're going to get through the next hour how we're going to uh, handle the day, what the week looks like. The more that you can create a plan and invite staff to be a part of that plan, communicate the plan, and you're going to have to communicate the plan a lot because people are really distracted. All of, all of you will be really distracted with the many co competing priorities that you've got, so you might not hear it the first time or the second time. The other thing that happens is, and you heard a lot of the speakers talk about the importance of communication. I love what Kathy was saying about communication because it is so critical. And what happens from an organizational perspective is that in the absence of uh, information is assumptions. And assumptions are really tough to deal with. And so as a leader, you may find yourself spending a lot more time than usual um, clearing up assumptions and just providing facts and data. You might find that there's a lot of complaints about um, administrative functions. And by administrative functions, I mean administrative uh, systems that people have been using that worked really well before the fire may not be working right now. And so people will find that messy zone really challenging and that a lot of frustrations with the administrative functions or procedures or systems that they use. And the other thing that happens a lot in organizations is that, is that you may have people in your team that isolate yourself. What I heard from Calgary and Slave Lake for the social profits that I worked with 
after those um, community disasters was that it became so apparent really quickly that there's a number of different coping styles on your team and you're going to have some people on your team that really need to be physically connected with people. They're touching one another a lot more. They're hugging. They want to be embracing. So they want to be physically connected. You'll have other people on your team that can't stand that and, and that are repulsed by it and it irritates them. And the more affection that goes on, the more they push people away. I've seen some people laugh. Are you experiencing this already? <laughs> so this is something to be aware of. And, and you know, we, we all handle things differently. So please know that some people are going to welcome a hug and other people are going to need space. And you'll have some people who, who, depending on their working style, because organizationally we have four working styles. We have the drivers that are the get it done people, right? They're all about results. Then we have the amiables that are the relationship people. They care about peace and fairness and harmony. Then we have the, excuse me, the expressives, and they're the big picture thinkers. So while you're trying to solve a small problem for the day, such as how do I get the photocopier going, they're off writing a proposal for photocopiers to end world hunger. Like it just gets stretched right out. So you've got the expressives. And then you've got the analytical working styles that are really detail focused. And that what helps them cope is information, facts, and details. And so what we have to do as leaders, and I'll send you some information around how you can use those four working styles to really help your team cope and be resilient. But when you understand the working styles of your team, and so for the board, that goes for all of you as well, what will happen is that you're going to be uh, able to more easily and quickly identify when people on the team are struggling. One of the interesting things that one of the social prophets um, said to me in, in Slave Lake, and this was two years after, their, after they had been um, in the community, so it wasn't recent, you know, it wasn't upon re-entry, it was well into their recovery and rebuilding phase. Um, one of them said that in six weeks, their staff and volunteers had burned out. That's a really scary thought, isn't it? Six weeks. And the reason why is that their organization hadn't really prepared to learn about compassion fatigue. They hadn't learned to look at what resilience is and what they needed to do. So you're at a perfect time right now to be able to actually be exploring that. So it might feel a bit clunky. For many of you, uh, it feels clunky. I was having a great conversation at one of the tables about sort of just getting dressed for work right now. That you might have, you know, outfits that have come from family members, friends, people you don't know, <laughs> one of the donation centers. So things feel clunky, and they're going to feel clunky for a long time. But it's going to feel clunky for all of you. So it's not just that one person's feeling the clunk. I love the picture of the flat tire because it really reminds me of what it feels like when an organization is struggling and is experiencing. Um, impaired resilience or a struggling with compassion fatigue. It feels like you're driving on flat tires and trying to change gears and that gear shift. How many of you drove a standard car when you were learning to drive? Hands up. Do you remember the experience of trying to get those gears working and then when you're uphill and you're trying to hold the car and do all that stuff? That's what it's going to feel like for a lot of us. That that simple processes that have been so easy for you and you could do them with your eyes closed are going to take a lot of work and effort. So it's important to be gentle with yourself. We have a lot of high achievers in the room and I say that because I know some of you very, very well. And so for us high achievers, we place really big standards on ourselves, don't we? And what we're capable of, what you're capable of, is going to look a little different when you get back. And that might change day to day as well. My granddad, who um, I just, he, he was a man of not a lot of words, and half the time I couldn't understand him because he had this strong Scottish accent. But he always told me something. It was actually before I got married, so I wasn't quite sure what the connection with him talking about crisis and giving me this beautiful speech before I walked down the aisle. But he said, everything you do in life, and any time you have a relationship, it's about giving 100% of your part. And some days, your 100%, all that you can give is 100% of 20% of what you're capable of. But you've still showed up and given 100%. So I guess my message there is just to be easy on yourself and to help staff understand that more patience, I guess you can say, with one another is going to really help the team. 
Change is messy. Uh, change is messy at the best of times. I do a lot of consulting and training with teams, and change on a good day is messy, and it takes people out of their comfort zone. One of, uh, one of the books I love on change management is by William Bridges, and some of you may have read his work. Has anyone read William Bridges' work? He has a great analogy, and what he says is that it's not always the change that people struggle with, it's the transition to make the change happen. And when I talked to folks from Calgary and Slave Lake, they told me that in their own words. They said, Charmaine, it wasn't the going, the going back to the community was difficult and painful and stressful. And in one part, it felt so good to be home as well. So it was like this conflicting emotion. That's how they described it. But they said, you know, what was really tough was not all the changes that they had to make in their life. It was the transitions that had to happen to make the change complete. So William Bridges, when he talks about change and transition, he says that change always begins with an ending. And lots of the people on your teams, your organizations, and in your client base have had lots of endings. You had lots of endings. The community doesn't look the same. Things will be different. And there's also a lot of beginnings. And it's that time in between the endings and the beginnings that are really tough for people. And the analogy that William Bridges uses, how many of you remember the cartoon What's the little guy's name who has the blanket? Linus. Linus. Thank you. I just lost his name for a minute. Linus. And so William Bridges says that change and transition is sort of like Linus on a day where his blanket is in the dryer. His sense of security is not with him. And that's one of the things that we see in compassion fatigue, one of the things that we see when teams are working hard to build a resilience. So recognize there's many times for all of you where you feel like your security blanket is in the dryer. Another way to think of it is sort of like walking on a tightrope. You're walking toward this way of new, and you've got your team with you, and you're doing the best you can with what you have, but there's that old way that we haven't yet stepped out of. And it's that dance we have to do between the way things were and the way things are going to be. And together, you'll be figuring that out. What I learned from Slave Lake and uh, Calgary was something really interesting. One of the ladies that I worked with, she was with a, a social profit organization of, I think, about 15 staff. And she said, looking back, if there was things I would do differently around compassion, fatigue, and resilience, one of the things I would do is to make sure that we have check-ins all the time. Because we're going to be on different committees. You heard the speakers talking about the different committees that will happen. You'll be doing work differently. You'll be figuring out a lot as you go. And she said the one thing that would have made a huge amount of difference was for me to, as a leader to be able to pull our team together, whatever that looked like. If it meant such, such staff were kind of joining in the meeting by FaceTime, you know, because that's what they could do. They weren't in the community yet. But she said the more that you can do to connect with people, even if it's a 15-minute meeting or touch base, the more that you're connected with people, the more that you can see where the team is at on a day-to-day -day basis and where they may need some support. Uh, different, let's go back to the picture, the comment here about different coping and different needs. How many of you see, have seen already uh, with the conversations you're having with your staff and your co-workers and uh, your board members that in that group of people, in that mix of people that are part of your organization, that there's lots of different ways that people are coping. How many people are seeing that? So let's just hear from a few of you. What are the different ways that you're hearing people coping? What words would you use to describe that? Isolate. So some people are isolating themselves. How many of you have seen that, where they're sort of retreating, isolating, people can't even get a hold of them? Um, you know, which creates a whole bunch of other challenges and fears. And, and again, in the absence of information, what do we get? Assumptions. And then people act on the assumptions. So isolation is something we see now and probably we'll have to be prepared for seeing that when we go back to our community. And thinking now as a leadership and an organizational perspective, what can we do to manage that for our team and keep, keep tabs on that? What else are you seeing? Isolation, what else? Fear? I thought you said beer at first, but then fear. I figured it was fear. <laughs> okay, it was fear. Absolutely. And that's it. You buy all the wine for your mom. You want that in the 
minutes. <laughs> so fear. And what's one of the interesting things, I love Jack Canfield's analogy of fear. And he has an acronym for it. He says fear is about false expectations appearing real. And what we often do in fear mode is we focus on the fear, we focus and we talk about all the things we don't want, and we kind of step into that mindset that takes us into that path. What is really funny, I'm just going to share a really ridiculously funny and embarrassing story. So today as I'm driving here, I'm thinking, oh, I hope I brought my backup cord because it would really suck if my computer did a weirdo thing that happened last week at a presentation I was doing. So what's in my mind? Is my computer not working? <laughs> I'm looking over here because I can relate to the story. So then I get here and then I'm having cell phone weirdness issues. And then my computer, while I was taking videos and everything, decides to do a Windows update. Don't you love it when they do that without your permission? How many of you have experienced that? But it also decides to upgrade itself to Windows 10, which I don't think should happen without permission. But anyways, it did. So I'm forever now locked out of my computer. But I thought to myself, isn't that interesting? Where might that have started? I wonder if it started on my way here when I was thinking about all this computer stuff. And then, of course, the projector goes on the, on the fritz. So what I want to share about that is that our mindset really creates the way it shapes how we cope. It shapes our resilience. So one of the folks from Slave Lake said where she spent a lot of time, she was a counselor in a nonprofit organ, social profit organization, and she said where she spent a lot of time with her peers and colleagues was helping them reshape their mindset. And it helped people cope differently. So that's something else that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis in supporting your team. And remember, in different coping and different needs, you'll have people that need information. You'll people have people that don't want any information. They've got way too much information to handle already. And everyone's capacity to work will look different. But you're all in it together. Transition, there's the picture of the dryer. So what happens when people are in between an old way or a new way? What kind of things might you, what, what might you see or experience in your team? when the dryer is in the blank, uh, the blanket is in the dryer, so to speak. What might you notice as a leader or a team member? The blanket might never come out of that dryer. Right? I'm left alone on an iceberg. Yeah. So that might, that might be some people's experience. What else might people be experiencing in between sort of the old and the new or as they're coping with compassion fatigue or becoming more resilient? Any other thoughts? Confusion, frustration, uncertainty. <laughs> Thank you, Janine. Confusion, frustration, uncertainty, exactly. Those are all the things that we can prepare to expect. Now, it's all about starting to build resilience now. So let me just ask you before I go into a couple of tips, what are some things that you think you can do in your organization right now before even heading back to Fort McMurray? Because when you all head back is even different times and in different ways, and the capacity to which your organizations will be running will look different. What are some things that you could do after today as leaders to really help your teams start building resilience creating a mindset that is going to support their healing and growth. And to have compassion fatigue, sort of that reminder that we don't want to get to that place um, in the back of our mind. What are some things that you could do? Let's hear from each table. Actually, you know what we'll do? We have, what time are we at? We're only at 1.32, is that right? So actually, let me give you two minutes at each table at your table to come up with a few ideas of what you will do or what you can do between now and Fort McMurray to start building resilience in your team and to combat compassion fatigue. So I'll put my timer on for how many minutes? Two. Awesome. I wonder if we can hear from a few of you. What are some of the things? We've got a room full of brilliant, genius people here. So what are some things that we can do to Start building resilience. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm very patient, so I can stand here as long as it takes for hands to come up. So let's hear from a few of you. What, if, what can you do between now and Fort McMurray to start building resilience? 
What about your table constant? What did you guys come up with? Situation. I've seen people laughing with each other. Some of the things that I've heard people share about what they brought um, with them is so people are finding humor. I know for some of you that's how you cope. I mean, humor is helpful. You hit your hand up. So you said a few things. One of them is showing your cat, your staff that you care about them as people, as human beings, so important. Uh, especially as the work starts to happen when people go back and, and we're in this zone of figuring out things in a new way. Um, and, and then also I heard you talk about giving people tasks, communicating accurate information. So I can't stress how important that is. Sometimes um, you're not going to have answers as leaders. Is that fair to say that up until today, there's been lots of questions that have come up that you have no clue how to answer? Is that fair? And that's going to probably continue to happen. And to recognize that might be part of this new normal, as we heard um, earlier today, and that might last a while. I've heard lots of people I know that are uh, in Fort McMurrayites, and um, I'm hearing things like people say, Oh, I don't even know what to do, like I'm awake, I've had my coffee, and I don't even know what I should be doing. I can't even get into my email, or I don't even know my passwords to do social media for our organization, like I don't know what to do. And so know, know that that's normal. And even when you get back to the community, despite a big to-do list and pressures coming at you, there, may be, there will be times where you're thinking, I have no idea which foot to put out first. And sometimes it might be just put either foot out. Pick a foot and take a step and know that that might be the right step that you need to take that day. So it's not about expecting perfection of you. And for board members, it's really important. It was Kathy that talked about setting the tone for your organization. That is critical. So when, you're, when your board sets the tone that we're going to get through this together, and how we do that might look different and change over the next six months, year, three years, but we're going to do this together and we might have to change our expectations, but our real priority is, is our people, the staff and the clients we serve and our community relationships. And where there's a focus on resilience, having that focus in your leadership will help people and it'll change how you deliver services. It will help people stay resilient. So when we think about a few things that we can do, it's about being kind to yourself. Uh, for those of us that are the drivers that place high expectations on ourselves, um, we might need to be a little easier. Adjust our expectations. Allow yourself time to heal. You know, one of the things I heard from uh, one of the women who worked with young children in Slave Lake, she was not in a part of the community that her house was affected, and nor was the place that she worked. So where she lived in the community looked the same as when she left. The rest of the other parts of the community did not. And what she said was really important around allowing yourself time to heal is, is the difference between, and this is her words, the difference between Slave Lake and Fort McMurray is that you know, everybody went through 
this in Fort McMurray. You all had to leave. Whereas in Slave Lake, things it was a different scenario and a different impact on the community. So she said that she didn't allow herself time to heal. When she, when, when she sort of got back into it, she jumped in with both feet and went running. And she said in six weeks, she was physically and emotionally exhausted. She had nothing left to give. And it's that analogy, you know those pickup trucks that have two gas tanks? You've got the one that you use, and what's the other one called? The reserve tank. What we often do when life is normal as caregivers and service providers is that we serve people from our main tank, and then what do we dip into? We dip into our reserve tank, and we continue serving and helping people heal from our reserve tank. And if it doesn't get filled up, it's dry. There's nothing left. It's really important for you to help your staff understand that while they might be serving clients, they also have to be serving themselves and healing themselves. And it might take a long time. Enhance yourself with awareness. So you've been receiving um, these, uh, We've been calling them, I think, the critical doc critical information for social profit documents every week. One of the things that we'll be putting in there is every week there will be information for you, for your team, for your board, around compassion fatigue, around resilience, things that you can do to be resilient. So really helpful information that they can use in the team and also that they can use with the clients that they serve. And accept that your path, um, that you're on a path and that you're on a path. So sometimes for us to be able to move forward, we have to accept where we are now, knowing that that path can change a lot, and that we might feel like we're without our, our blanket because it's in the dryer. Making sure that you exchange information. Um, allowing people time to share their stories, to talk, sort of what you were saying earlier, Constance. Listen to people who are struggling, recognizing that their struggle may not be our struggle. And one of the things I heard leaders talk about that have gone through crises and disasters before is sometimes there's an expectation that we all agree on the struggle. And with this kind of coping, we're talking about accepting people's experiences for what they are. Recognizing ours might look very different. And developing personal boundaries. Um, I've been hearing from lots of social prophets that they are just so overwhelmed with just email. You know, and just getting to email. And, and so much of the email is good wishes and loving thoughts and people checking in with us, but it can be exhausting. Is that a fair statement? C can any of you relate to that? Okay, so um, sometimes we have to develop boundaries. And one organization I love, she created a great slogan for her team. They call it unplug time. And she does this in her family now too, where there's actually times where they have to unplug, because she was saying that she was so attached to her cell phone following social media and you know news and everything that she could that it was absorbing her it was just sort of taking her into this vortex and not letting her out so we might have to develop different boundaries than we had before um, and helping staff and i guess the big one for me is to ask for help one of the things that i have love 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 about fort mcmurray i loved it when i lived there and i still love it this many years later, is the sense of community that you have with the social profits. I work around the world, I've worked in five countries with social profits around the world, and I have never, ever seen the type of connection and resource and support that community organizations give each other like you do in Fort McMurray. So now more than ever, those relationships and networking groups that you belong to are critically important. You're each other's resource. For the executive directors, I know there's opportunities for you all to get together as executive directors. You're each other's resource. So make sure that you learn to feel comfortable asking for help. Um, I love the work of Brene Brown. Does anyone know Brene Brown's work? She talks about vulnerability, and there's a great video that I'll send you the link to. It's a short one, but a good one, about part of what we're coping with now is new boundaries and a new sense of vulnerability for us. And for many people, that'll be tough to get used to. Um, the other perspective is, for many people, it will make their life so, so much richer. Maybe not tomorrow, but down the road. So learning to ask for help, and just remember that you have this amazing network of people in your community that will support you and walk with you when you're having a tough time. You don't have to go out alone. 
And I just want to say I wish you all well. And one thing I know about Fort McMurray, um, when I did my thesis in 2000, I don't even remember, it was a long time ago, 2000, and one of the things that came out of my study was about resilience and how resilient Fort McMurray and the region has been over the years. So I know that this community um, has the people and the supports to be able to, what I call, bounce forward, not bouncing back. So I encourage you all to walk away today and do something kind for yourself, to take time for you to do that every day, and to do what you can every day to support your team. And the last statement I want to say is by Oscar Wilde. Gosh, I love the work of Oscar Wilde. With all of this that's going on, Oscar Wilde has a great quote, and he says, above all, be yourself, because everybody else is already taken. Thank you so much. Now, wasn't that great? Didn't that kind of uh, give us a whole other dimension to our conversations and our reflections here this afternoon? To think about ourselves and think about being good to ourselves and to the people that we work with. And so I think that's very helpful for us to uh, to remember those things. Uh, it's, it's good to be reminded of those as well. Um.